All right. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to Open Force Field's second follow-up workshop. This is uh, going to focus on the use of the new interchange package that Matt Thompson is the lead developer for. Uh, and so before we get started, let me give you a little bit of background information for how this is going to be run. Um, so uh, these follow-up workshops, unlike our annual workshop, where the annual workshop was uh, just a presentation of information uh, with not that much room for feedback, these follow-up workshops are intended to be an avenue for feedback. And so we uh, have a large Q&A and developer support session at the end. We encourage you to um, interrupt the speaker if you have a question, either uh, you can post it in the chat or you can uh, just say it verbally when there's when there's a natural pause and we'll be asking for questions. Um, we ask you to be a little bit patient. Uh, so not only will the speaker be executing code uh, that brings with it all of the, the joys and the sorrows of a live demo, but also we would like you to be executing this code as well. And so, um, you know, this is gonna be sort of a more technical session and uh, this isn't just gonna be a presentation of science, but also sort of getting into the nitty gritty technical aspects of how to use open force field tools. This meeting will be recorded for the first portion. So we have uh, prepared material. Today it will be a number of Jupyter notebooks that we'll be going through together. Um, yeah, so this session will be recorded. Um, any Anything you say and, and whatnot will be, uh, you know, you should assume that it's public. It's gonna be uploaded to YouTube. Uh, after the prepared material, we will turn off the recording. And so then you can maybe feel a little bit more free to have Q&A, but at no point in this meeting is there an expectation of privacy. Uh, Open Force Field does not sign non-disclosure agreements. And so, um, you know, if, if you're trying this out on your own data, which we strongly encourage you to do, but that, you know, is project data or something, uh, <laughs> you, can, you can try to contact us in a more private venue, but again, nothing here is going to be uh, super private. Um, yeah, so basically assume that this whole meeting is a public space. Now, the general plan for today is that we're going to have one to two hours of prepared material uh, presented by Matt, and then we'll have an extended um, discussion and Q&A period, and then a developer support session um, where we really encourage you to, if you're having trouble setting things up on your own computer, uh, an open force field developer can, can hop into a separate Zoom call with you and, and get it going, and then we can come back into the main room um and yeah if if you try to put in your data and you get a new and exciting error message uh or or you know there's something fundamentally um that that you need that open force field doesn't provide this this latter portion of today's meeting is going to help us collect use cases so we can make tools that are more useful for you so on the confluence page for today's workshop and i'll go ahead and Matt, could you paste the Confluence page? I've somehow lost it. Um, but we have uh, the materials for today prepared and uh, we have install instructions so that you can get this running on your own computer. And all that's required is the, um, the, the Conda kind of use your space package manager. So please, if you haven't already, go ahead and uh, begin executing the instructions on that page. Uh, today, you'll be checking out a Git repository and um, building a conda environment that will let you follow along. If for any reason uh, your computer is unable to, to get everything running uh, the same way that you see the, the presenter, Matt, showing how it works, we have binder links available we'll, where you'll get a free uh, cloud instance with all of the dependencies installed. Um, and unlike yesterday's workshop for people who are there, if you do have trouble installing, just use the binder uh, for the for the prepared material part of the session, and then during the developer support in the in the later part of the session, um, an open force field developer will help you get everything set up on your own machine. Um, right, and then finally today, uh, there is one additional advanced notebook that we've added to the materials that won't be um, in the the binder package, and so we may or may not get to it. Uh, we'll see how the timing is going. But uh, there's an advanced notebook showing how to use virtual sites and interchange. And whether or not we get to it, we will update the binder link after this meeting uh, to, to contain that additional notebook. So 
does anybody have any questions about the the running of this workshop? Okay. If not, I'll turn the floor over to uh, our senior software scientist, Matt Thompson. He's a lead developer of Interchange, and he's been with Open Force Field for a number of years now, doing a lot of the critical work that um, you know keeps things running and installing. And so, yeah, Matt, if you like, please take it away. Thanks. Excuse me. Thanks, Jeff, for the introduction. Um, I will show off my technical prowess by taking the right uh, window to display as I screen share. Um, I think, eh, is this, do you see my, my Confluence page here or do you see something else? Yep, we see your Confluence page. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I am um, just on this Confluence page that we've uh, distributed out and there's a, a, it's a, again, in the chat is a link. Um, so at the bottom, um, there's a link to a GitHub repository that includes all of the materials um, uh, that have been prepared for this workshop. Um, and one of them is the README that serves as um, sort of the, the structure and the loose agenda for today. Um, so these are the uh, installation instructions again, um, but the stuff we'll actually be covering um, includes mostly high level stuff. So um, our, our objectives include uh, summarizing the key objectives of the project and um, kind of painting around the boundaries of what the current scope of supported functionality is. Um, depending on sort of the, the time you have left and, uh, and user interest, um, there are some more experimental features that are a little bit more forward, uh, forward facing that we might have time to get to, um, but those are far from uh, reliable, reliable yet uh, for use in production. Um, most of the time we'll spend going through the high level API of interchange. Um, believe it or not, uh, in about two hours, I won't really have time to get into the nitty gritty of the internals. Um, but depending on um, if, depending on how much people want to hook into those internals for their own work, um, that's certainly something I'd be, I'd be happy to work on. Uh, with people outside of outside of the workshop. Um, yeah, so those are the high level objectives. Um, uh, because there's a good bit of stuff to go through, um, I, I don't think it would be wise to put everything into one notebook. Um, so uh, unfortunately, things are scattered uh, across a bunch of notebooks, um, but I think it, it makes each one of them a little bit more digestible. Um, so these are the notebooks. Uh, they are mostly in the order we're going to go through them. Um, so the first thing we're actually going to go through is uh, talking about units, uh, which is not uh, in specific to interchange. It's it's more uh, the entire stack. Um, but then we're going to go talk a little bit about the objectives and sort of uh, design. Then we're going to make some interchange objects. Then we're going to show how we can export them to different uh, objects and file formats that uh, are used in the simulation engines that you use. Um, and then uh, we go a little bit out of order and we'll be going through the protein ligand example, um, which uh, takes a, a sort of mostly prepared system of a docked ligand in some protein used in um, some protein we can benchmark. So I believe the files that were used for benchmarking um, parsely and or possibly Sage as well. Um, but we'll go through that and show how we can um, go from those input files to OpenMM and other engines um, using just uh, open force field tools, mostly the toolkit and interchange. Um, then we'll take a, a step back and go to um, uh, a notebook where we explore um, a little bit more of the, just a little bit of the internals, um, specifically the potential handlers. Um, and then de depending on the time left and what people want to see, we, we might uh, do a little bit with virtual sites or um, at that point it might, um, we, we might go into the, the, the last developer hour. Okay, um, so that's a, a rough picture of what we will 
be going through today. Um, I believe I shared my window or I, my desktop and not a window, so you should see my terminal now. Yep. Cool. Uh, okay, so I'm going to assume that we have made our con environments by now. So um, I did the same thing as well. So we will want to activate the environment. I hope I spelled this right. Okay, cool. Uh, and from here, um, if you would, uh, here. From here, you can, um, oh, sorry. I need to go into the repo. And then here, I will pull up um, not a specific notebook, but if I just point it to the notebooks directory, it will pull up, um, it'll pull up the, the directory. Um, and from here, I'll open each of the notebooks one by one. Um, so I believe I said the first thing I was going to go into is units. Um, as a sort of design decision, um, uh, interchange specifically, but also a lot of the rest of OpenFF software um, tries to tag things that might have physical meaning uh, with, uh, with units. So instead of you know, just being numbers like floats or numpy arrays, um, these are um, unit wrapped objects called quantities. Um, there are a handful of unit solution uh, unit packages out there. Um, we provide our own, which happens to be basically a pretty thin wrapper around Pint um, with just a couple tweaks to make our stuff easier and a little bit more friendly to um, computational chemistry. But um, most of uh, that package should behave similarly to Pint, if you're familiar with it, um, if, if you've used it in the past in, in other packages. Um, so the, the kind of basic usage is, so we'll want to import this unit. Um, this is technically an object, but it kind of behaves as a namespace. Um, you, you'll, use, you'll use from openff.units import unit a lot in your code. Um, uh, I like to make uh, these quantities with the quantity constructor, which um, for almost all uses will just take the actual values you're wrapping and then um, a unit object. Um, you pass those to the constructor and you get the object out. Um, like I said, this unit thing acts like a namespace and it has a bunch of these things dangling off of them where you can kind of, if it's a, if it's a commonly used unit, um, you can kind of do unit dot and then type it out and tab complete and it will probably be there. So um, here, this is just nanometers. Uh, you don't need to import anything more than just the unit. Um, as a shorthand, you can also just multiply the number by the unit object. Um, and this cell just demonstrates that, that, these, are, that these are the same thing. Um, some of the other things you'll, you'll, you'll probably want to do with them are convert them to something of a different unit. And there are sort of a, a few different ways or a few different um, yeah, use cases like this. So if you use uh, quantity dot two and then pass it a different unit, it will convert that quantity into a different quantity. It will not do it in place. So um, here, if I really needed that quantity to be in angstroms, I would give you, I would either need to uh, store it back into itself or create a different uh, a different object in memory. Um, if you want to talk to something that does not want the units to be associated with them, like um, if you're you know if you're writing to some file format and you just need the number and you just want to trust that you have the units, um, there are a few different ways to do that. There is a dot magnitude. Um, uh, what is it? Property or property like thing, I suppose. Um, and that will just spit out whatever whatever the number is, and it will effectively strip the unit um, and not do anything particularly smart or special around that. So that's that's very very fast. Um, if you want to be sure um, that you are writing something out with particular units, you can use m as and pass it a unit, and then it will um, do the conversion and then strip the unit out. So in this case, you can see. If I just do dot magnitude or it's alias dot m, then I just get the number that I had and it has no knowledge of the units. But if I want to convert it to angstroms and strip the units out, I can do that. 
Um, and just to show it works, if you want to do m as and ensure that it's still nanometers, just in case you did something earlier in your code, that kind of that kind of works as expected as well. Um, you'll often find, or well, we often find anyway that that uh, serialization of our objects is very important. So, you know, serializing at force fields, molecules, topologies, so on and so on. And um, Pint does a little bit of magic um, to make this happen pretty, pretty well out of the box. So you can just call the string, uh, the, the built-in string function um, on any quantity object, and it will give out a string with a pretty sane representation. Um, this is one that's obviously human readable, um, but it's also one that conveniently is uh, machine readable as well, in a sense, or at least pint readable. So I can pass that string directly back to the quantity constructor, and it will actually parse the string in the units and, and all that. Um, so this is a, a kind of, uh, this is a very small in scope example, but this, uh, uh, this serialization, this serialization round trip is basically what we do at scale for these sort of thousands of line long um, force field files, uh, for example. Uh, okay, uh, so you uh, might have um, some existing code that uses OpenMM, and OpenMM has its own units package, um, which which works great, and um, we want to make sure that we offer interoperability between those. Um, so we have a small sub-module here um, that offers these two functions from OpenMM and to OpenMM. Uh, they do what I, I hope it seems like they would do on, 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 the, on the tin, just based off of the names. Um, they convert these OpenFF quantities to or from and to uh, OpenMM quantities. So in this case, I make a distance of 24 meters or uh, I make a quantity object of 24 meters. I can convert it to an open MM quantity that should be analogous in meaning. And you can see here that when I print it out, it appears to be still 24 meters and it's an open MM quantity. Uh, and then just I can go in the reverse direction and I can call from open MM on that. And uh, I get out just what I started, which is uh, hopefully not too surprising, but that's what we expect out of a round trip. There are uh, a few cases in which, um, so depending on sort of what libraries you're talking to and, and what versions of them, there might be some cases where like, I'm not sure if this positions vector is in OpenFF units or OpenMM units. And you can do like an is instance check or you, know, you can check the type of it and you can sort of have some branching logic out from there. And I've spent a, a good bit of time writing that code over and over again. So I wanted to provide a short, a short, short, shortcut to it. Um, uh, and that's in the form of this ensure quantity function. So this takes in two arguments. One of them is a um, quantity where you're not quite sure if it's OpenMM or OpenFF or, or potentially in the future, some other unit package. And then just a, a string saying which, which one you want it to be. Um, so if, uh, Kind of, kind of separately, um, you can use this question mark operator in Jupyter Notebooks to pull up the the, the kind of doc string help um, of um, of a function or a class if it's written. Uh, it works the same if you do um, question mark thing or thing question mark, and in this case, it pulls out the. Um, well, I guess it didn't write a doc string, but it pulls out the function signature, which I think should give you about as much information as you need. Um, uh, and these next two cells just demonstrate that uh, whether, or sorry, um, these demonstrate what happened if um, you call this function uh, passing these two different arguments. So you can see if I tell it to make it an open FF, to ensure that it's an open FF quantity, it, it does that, and the same thing with open MM. Um, for cases in which 
um, you would effectively convert to what it already is. It um, makes an effort to short circuit out of there. So if something's already an open MM unit and you want it to be an open MM unit, it won't do any round trip. Um, or uh, it won't do any round trip and it will just recognize that and, 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 short, and short circuit out of there. Um, uh, a last couple things about OpenMM. So uh, um, OpenMM sometimes provides array-like things as this as sort of kind of weird objects. Um, I'm, I'm assuming for reasons that relate to, to making stuff work faster on, on, on GPUs or something. But um, something that I find myself dealing with or kind of encountering a lot is um, positions from like a uh, like a PDB file object is this thing that's like a list of these vec three objects, um, and these are in, op in OpenMM units. And um, the the logic inside of this from OpenMM function um, makes an attempt to handle that. So you can see if I convert it from the OpenMM object to the OpenFF quantity, I get uh, uh, I get a wrapped NumPy array, which Hopefully, is stuff that uh, something that, that people here are are, are pretty familiar with. Um, and I kind of spent all of this time talking about this because it's not something that's just used in interchange. This is used now throughout uh, the toolkit as well, as of the most recent version. Um, so if we uh, pull up pull up the toolkit, we ensure that we're on version eleven or newer. Um, and we do something that probably uh, everybody in the audience does all day long. And uh, we make a molecule object from smiles. Uh, we can see, cool, we have a molecule that looks like, you know, like a quiz from OCHEM1 to, to pull out the name of it. Um, and we can, so say we want to generate the conformers for it and we want to assign partial charges for it. Um, those objects that are carried along with the molecule now are both uh, OpenFF unit quantities. Um, so I guess the, the conformers is a list of them just to ensure um, some partial compatibility with how things, how things work in the past because that's a list of conformers. Um, but you can see, uh, you can see this is using, uh, is using this unit solution. Um, yeah, so any questions about the units before um, uh, we move on to the next uh, the next notebook? Hey, Matt, uh, this isn't directly about the units, but I'm curious, could you say a little bit more about how the conformers are generated? <laughs> uh, I guess the, the short of it is um, stuff like conformer generation, partial charge assignment, um, a lot of the molecule API um, actually internally calls these toolkit wrappers, which are classes that um, basically get the molecule objects to uh, call RD kit or OpenAI toolkits or some other toolkits as well to, to do the heavy lifting. So um, things can get a little bit more, things can get slightly more involved if you have an OpenAI license, but um, for this workshop, we aren't installing OpenAI or, or dealing with the licenses there. So what is in these environments um, and what's in uh, all of your, your environments are RDKit and Amber tools. And if memory serves, the default behavior here is for the conformers to be generated by RDKit with, I think uh, it's a uh, rdkit.chem dot embed multiple conformers or something like that using some sort of some sort of sensible defaults. Um, and then I believe the A1BCC charge assignment happens by happens with Amber tools. I think it's uh, SQM is the program that does it. Um, so there's a lot more that we could talk about with that, I suppose, but the short of it is that this is all wrapped. This is all wrapping other chem informatics toolkits. Okay, got it. Thanks so much. Yep. Yeah, and one thing that I'll add is we we sort of highly prioritize interoperability of our molecule objects with uh, our DKIT and and OpenAI, and so people sometimes like if anybody was at the workshop yesterday, we had to we had to connect two molecules using a new bond, 
and uh, we we just sent it off to our D kit and had, did it over there. And this is why we don't have a lot of more flexible functionality in our own API is because we we want to encourage people to take an OFF mall, go to our D kit and, and modify it in strange and interesting ways, uh, and then just bring it back to an OFF mall when they're ready to do physics with it. And I think I saw Chapin unmute for a sec, so he might have a question. Yeah, one quick question from me, Matt. The mm -hmm. unit namespace is shared between open FF units and open MM units. So is there an easy way to import both of those into the same Python session? Yeah, um, good point. So um, a lot of, so what Jape is saying is you'll see a lot of existing code that imports this unit namespace or unit thing, whatever it is from open MM and what I'm, uh, telling people to use in the OpenFF stack is something like this. And the there's a collision here. So um, I personally, I just use an alias. Um, since I sort of want to get things into OpenFF units, I will do something like this. And then if I can, if I know how to type, then it looks a little bit, you know, funny, but uh, you know, you can just sort of, uh, work with this just like just like you were doing before. Did that answer yeah. your question, Chapin? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah, there's definitely a potential for that clash. Okay. Um, now let's move on to the objectives notebook. Um, this is this has the least code of any notebook. Um, zero code. Uh, and this is this is kind of setting the stage for the actual uh, aims of the project itself. Um, so interchange is a Python package um, provided by the open force field initiative um, with the high level objectives being uh, storing, manipulating and converting uh, molecular mechanics data. Um, there's sort of this core class of the same name um, and this does the storage and this provides uh, a, a bunch of methods kind of high level and low level as well to uh, do manipulation. Um, and then also some high level functionality for exporting things out um, to different uh, engines and formats and such. Um, the, its existence is in large part to provide a kind of discrete uh, state um, that results from doing, uh, doing your typing, uh, but before you uh, go into the anything you know OpenMM specific. Um, so just to continue on sort of the, the OpenMM usage example, um, if, if you spent um, time with OpenMM, you, you know it has a, a great API for doing all sorts of stuff, but one of the kind of tricky things is that you're dealing with a bunch of objects. So you have your positions, you have your topology, you'll have a system, and then eventually you have, you'll have your, your, your simulation and your context and, and all, all that other stuff as well. Um, and it can, if, if you're doing a lot of stuff at once or maybe some experiments, it can kind of uh, get a little bit difficult to keep track of everything and how everything is associated with each other. Um, and one of the things that Interchange does is, is it provides a single object that kind of serves as a container for all of those. Um, and uh, well, and the next notebook kind of goes through each of those uh, individual components. Um, the the focus in general uh, at the moment is uh, applying Spirinoff style force fields to chemical topologies. Um, topology being uh, a, a group of molecules, including potentially just one molecule if you're doing gas phase stuff, um, and then. Uh, and then we also want to export out to engines. Um, the current state in at a very high level is that we support OpenMM, I would say, pretty well. Um, Gromax and Amber are a little bit more in development, depending on sort of the use case. And then we also have a little bit of functionality for LAMPs, depending on how much people are interested in those. To, to uh, very broadly kind of give a picture of where the current functionality is at, um, 
uh, straightforward like physics calculations um, are are well supported for all of these engines. Um, more exotic stuff like polarizability is not supported anywhere, um, nor is it supported by uh, the Smirnoff spec uh, at the moment as well. Um, and then kind of the in-between stuff, you know, um, how well does the protein ligand system work in this engine? Uh, stuff like that, that kind of varies engine to engine. Um, later today, we'll be going through a protein ligand example in OpenMM. Um, but for example, I would doubt that works in the current lamps export. <laughs> Um, and also, charm is not something we have support for right now, but depending on interest of uh, our user base, that's something that, that we could provide. Uh, okay. Um, continuing to work through this, um, the, the, the key components of an interchange object um, are some representation of the physics, physics that results from applying the force field to the topology. Um, and it also stores box vectors, um, positions, uh, velocities, and also the topology itself, this, this chemical topology. Um, for most users, uh, this is the bridge between um, uh, loading up uh, a molecule data set and a Smirnoff force field into the toolkit, and then finding a way to use those in your engine of choice. Um, and yeah, this uh, diagram uh, unfortunately cuts off the word toolkit and interchange in, in ways that I, I couldn't find out how to fix. Uh, but this shows kind of a handful of different user flows. Um, you may have a OFFX ML or, or a Spinoff style force field. You want to load that into the toolkit and you get this force field object. Um, somewhat analogously, you'll end up with a molecule uh, object in the toolkit uh, or potentially a number of molecule objects if you want something that's uh, that, that's condensed phase. Um, this can come from a smiles uh, string, an SDF file, a PDB file, a bunch of different things um, that are all pretty well documented in um, the toolkit documentation. Um, if you're unfamiliar with that, there's a nice uh, cookbook for getting stuff into, into molecules uh, that I encourage you to take a look at. Um, once you have those, there's interchange dot from Smirnoff that takes those two objects and does, does everything with that. Um, optionally, also there are the box vectors, positions, and velocities that um, can two of two of those two of the two out of those three can be inferred from um, the topology object that's passed to from Smirnoff. Um, if if there are positions on the molecules and if the topology has box vectors. But you can also um, just set those on the interchange object as well. And then once you have that state created, uh, from there you can do the sort of manipulation and inspection. But you probably just want to get out to um, uh, running some simulations, and there are a few high-level functions that that handle that directly. Okay, that's the end of this notebook. Um, are there any questions on this before we move on to the next one? I might add, uh, Matt mentioned that we we have these different exporters on the right. We can go to Amber or OpenMM or Gromax. Uh, and and like you said, we sort of have different levels of confidence in each. Uh, on this on this figure, it's indicated almost as like dotted lines. Um, in terms of our confidence about exporting to OpenMM, it's very, very high for all of our released force fields. Uh, and we actually, in the last release, did a little a little sleight of hand, and now uh, folks who use the Open Force Field Toolkit in their workflows have seen the create OpenMM system method, uh, and actually all of it now runs through uh, interchange. Uh, so when we say that we're fairly confident in our export to OpenMM, we're so confident that actually the toolkit, when you run create OpenMM system, just makes an interchange and then converts that to an OpenMM system. Um, so yeah. And Matt, I wonder, do you want to mention uh, the from OpenMM method here? Yeah, good point. Um, so yeah, so I was talking all this about uh, how interchange tracks an internal state, uh, but I only, but I 
only talked about one way to get there. Um, and that's uh, partially because of the, the motivation of this is to help get uh, OpenFF stuff into others' engines. Um, but uh, from Smirnoff is not the only way to create an interchange object. And um, we hope that in the future, there will be a bunch of different uh, methods that do this. Um, there is from Foyer that can take in, um, I believe, a Foyer force field and an OpenFF topology with some all, with also some helper functions to interoperate between OpenFF topologies and inbuilt compounds. Um, and then there's also from OpenMM that takes in um, uh, that, that takes in populated OpenMM objects um, at very least a system and a topology, uh, and then creates an interchange from that. Um, it may, you know, you may wonder why you would actually want to do that, um, but there's a lot of interoperability hurdles and pathways that um, uh, make that actually useful in some cases. Um, also, OpenMM has a ton of interoperability and a bunch of file loaders, um, and um, there's also OpenMM force fields out there that provides a nice way to get um, uh, a version of GAF and Espaloma, and I think a couple other force fields as well, um, into parameterized systems, but only into uh, OpenMM. So, um, yeah, so OpenMM is another, uh, it's, it's a little bit experimental, and we, we may or may not have time to get, get to it later today. Um, but the key point here is that there are going to be a bunch of different from X methods to create these interchange objects. All right, Thanks. if there are no more questions, um, let's see, we're at 40 past. So we have still a little bit of time before the, before the first break. Um, I believe the next notebook, let, let me check what that one uh, objective is. Okay, cool. All right, so uh, we're gonna get back to actually working with some code and, um, nope, that's not that one. Okay, so I am in the construction notebook um, and what we're going to be talking about here mostly is actually using uh, interchange dot from Smirnoff. Uh, so uh, for reasons that I'm in the process of fixing right now, um, the actual import of interchange takes a few seconds, uh, which is I, I think is, is, is not good. Um, but I'm, I'm working on I'm working on uh, uh, fixing that right now. But anyway, once you have that imported, we can check out the doc string for from Smirnoff. And there's a lot of complexity here. Um, and unfortunately, the type signatures right now are a little bit uh, are, are a little bit hard to read. But the, the important bits here are that the required arguments are force field and topology. And the force field object is a, uh, a Smirnoff force field using this object provided by the toolkit. And then the topology uh, is ideally, ideally a topology, but we also uh, allow you to pass in a list of molecules as well. And in the case of passing a list of molecules, the first thing that happens is that is converted to a topology using the toolkit API. There are some other uh, optional arguments that are there for largely for compatibility with existing toolkit behavior. Um, those are a little bit less important, so we're not going to get through them today. Um, but again, uh, the, the main point here is force field and topology, and that's what you need. Um, we're going to ignore this uh, tool, this, this, this open eye warning. Um, um, yeah, so uh, when you call it um, internally, it will use the toolkit's uh, smarts matching logic, um, just in the same way the toolkit has been doing for, um, I, I suppose, several years now. Um, it, it does this by directly calling the same toolkit APIs that were called before. Um, recall that one of the things that makes Mirnoff uh, a little bit unique is the use of direct chemical perception, um, which does a lot of, uh, which has a lot of cool uh, features and effects that the actual scientists will, would do a better job of explaining than me. But one of the consequences of that is that there's not a uh, explicit concept of an atom type um, that you might be familiar with if you're 
if you're familiar with basically using any other uh, MD engines out there. Um, and so by extension, these don't exist as sort of very important first class things in interchange. Um, there are ways to get them to be important for compatibility with uh, other typing schemes, um, but I probably won't get that get into that today. Um, probably if you're working with interchange a lot, um, what you will find is, as is pretty common working with MD stuff, a lot of your time goes into system preparation. Um, and a lot of the time here will still be system preparation, uh, hopefully a little bit a uh, little bit less than before. Um, and of the time you do spend preparing your inputs, most of it will actually be getting things into structures that the toolkit understands. Uh, because once you're there, once you have your first skill from your topology, um, it's the same method that you would call uh, any time. So, okay, let's uh, let's keep going. So um, this block of code um, does, um, uh, I think just what, just what we did in the in a, a notebook or two ago. Um, we load a molecule from Smiles. Um, I don't know the name of this molecule, but it looks vaguely drug-like, let's say. Um, and for reasons that will become clear later, I want to get two conformers on this molecule. So um, I call it generate conformers. I tell it, please give me two conformers. And because this molecule is big enough to have two uh, kind of chemically distinct conformers, um, it, it, it has those. And I believe, yeah, so the, the default representation here for something with multiple conformers um, actually displays them kind of like an empty trajectory. Um, this is using NGLDU, I believe. Uh, so we can see, cool, we have our two different conformers. Um, and then I want to make a topology from this molecule. Um, and yeah, now I have one of the two inputs I need. Um, the other one is, let's just get a force field. This is a small molecule. Let's just use a small molecule force field. Let's load up Sage. Um, and yes, uh, this will be a time uh, I make the point that um, currently interchange implements everything that's in this Smirnoff specification. Uh, except for uh, GPSA models, which we can, we could prioritize if that is something that's that's important, uh, important enough to enough people. Um, but the nice thing about that, about, about the current support, the current state of support, is that because um, almost all of this Mirnoff spec is implemented, that means new force fields that are developed using the current Smirnoff specification are kind of de facto supported. So uh, there are a handful of features that um, show a lot of promise for sort of various scientific reasons, but for uh, other reasons have not made, made them into mainline OpenFF force fields. Um, two good examples of this are virtual sites and um, WBO-based WBO uh, valence parameter interpolation. So these are ones that uh, you could write a force field that um, has this in them and interchange supports those. Uh, and as long as you follow this Smirnoff specification, um, you, can, you can expect um, interchange to understand, uh, to, to understand that. Um, not a Smirnoff section per se, but um, everything is in place for uh, biomolecule support. Um, and so this is all to say that once any of these features finds their way into Sage or, sorry, once finds their way into Rosemary, uh, or I believe after Rosemary is, is time, or if you want to write your own Smirnoff force field, as long as you follow the Smirnoff spec, these are supported by interchange. Um, And, and that would also include uh, if you do a bespoke fit. Um, so if you want to refit torsions for a specific ligand, um, the result of doing that is you actually create a separate force field. And you can just load that up into, into interchange just like before. Um, and I believe there's an interchange workshop. Uh, sorry, there's a bespoke fit workshop in, I believe, a couple of weeks. 
um, that I, I think will be int of interest to a lot of people. Okay, um, enough of enough of that. Uh, we can do what I said we can do and call dot from Smirnoff, pass it our first field, pass our topology, and we get this interchange object out. Um, and then the wrapper just displays a very small summary of information. I have seven potential handlers. I did not specify periodicity on my topology or pass in a box argument to from Smirnoff, so it does not know anything about periodicity, so it assumes it is not periodic. And then in my topology, I have 23 atoms. Okay, let's actually go through some of, oh, sorry. Um, before we do that, let's uh, hit this point that Jeff mentioned earlier. Um, you may be familiar with using force field dot create open mm system. Um, no, sorry. This cell is a little bit out of date. Um, I think maybe that should be, yeah, sage oh, yes. dot create. Okay. Yeah. So um, if you're familiar with force field dot create open mm system that takes in a topology. Um, like Jeff said earlier, now a lot of that heavy lifting that was previously done by the toolkit is now done by interchange. So now when you call force field dot create open open mm system internally, an interchange object is created and then it is converted out to open mm. So these two lines of code do basically what the toolkit does now when you call it. Um, however, you can also get from the toolkit. Oh, sorry. There, there, there are two similar points here that can be made. Uh, one of them is the point Jeff made about, uh, about what happens internally in the toolkit. The other is if you have a force field in the topology, you can call interchange dot from Smirnoff, or you can also call force field dot create interchange and those will have the same effect. Those will combine the force field and the topology into an interchange object. Okay, um, let's step through some of these components now. Uh, so there are five components, uh, zero of which are required, but at least two of which you're probably going to want to exist. Uh, we have a topology, which stores chemical information um, uh, independently of the first field. We have handlers or potential handlers, uh, as, as, as they're called often um, internally here. Uh, and these map the um, force field parameters onto uh, kind of what is actually uh, what is actually stored in the final um, in the final systems that you run uh, MD on. Um, the force field is not stored directly anywhere in interchange. It's the result of applying the force field to a topology. We also have uh, positions and velocities, which are positions and velocities. And then we also have uh, box vectors, which is just the information about the periodicity. Um, like I said, none of these are required. You can just create an empty interchange, but I'm not totally sure why you would do that. Um, there's, there's no information here, so I, I, don't know, I don't know what you could do with that. The topology attribute. <sighs> Um, carries directly a toolkit topology. So um, this does not act like a toolkit topology, it just is. Um, so the same API, the same functionality uh, is the same if you do interchange.topology.whatever compared to if you call that whatever on the topology that you you'd probably prepared beforehand. So for example, here in a topology, we may, we may be curious about the number of atoms, number of bonds or the smiles uh, that represents the first atom or first first molecule. Um, the smiles of the first atom is like, probably not very useful. Um, the In the future, there may be a separate uh, way of doing this in, in interchange. You know, I'm, we may not always use the toolkits uh, topology object, but for now it's, for now it's worked great. Um, we also have these um, potential handlers that are stored as a dictionary mapping between uh, a string that identifies effectively the type um, and then a uh, 
potential handler object, of which here you're seeing a bunch of uh, subclasses. Um, we have a, the, the exploration notebook later goes into a lot more detail about these because they're a little bit more complicated than, than, uh, uh, than I can get to in just a couple of cells. Um, so we'll, we'll go a little bit deeper into those later. Um, and then we also carry positions along. Um, these are uh, just OpenFF quantities. Um, in this case, um, so interchange has a little bit of logic in it inside of from Smirnoff to read uh, from each of the molecules if they have conformers. And then if all the molecules have conformers, um, interchange kind of assumes that those are the positions you want things to be, um, you know, those are the positions you want things to have. So in this case, the positions of the interchange object are directly, it's, it's the same as the, as that zeroth conformer of a molecule. Um, for what it's worth, just kind of by conventions for, for most use cases uh, of the toolkit, it will be the zeroth or the first conformer that's read. Um, so, so I, I suppose just be aware of that if you have a lot of conformers and it's really important which, which one is, uh, is actually used. Um, and yeah, this just shows uh, I have an OpenFF quantity um, the same object we, we we were talking about a few minutes ago. And then these positions look like they certainly could be uh, atomic positions for this molecule. Um, however, if you wanted to not use the zeroth conformer, um, you don't have to. Um, you just have to uh, set the positions again. Um, the setter should take anything that is array-like and is of the shape number of atoms by three, kind of as, as you would expect. Um, and this block of code just demonstrates how we can pass it the second conformer in, my, in the molecule, pass it to the position setter, and then now no longer, uh, and, and this is, and this is uh, immediately updated in the, um, in the interchange object. So if you wanted to, you could look at, I'm not 100% sure about the, okay. So the first atom is at, is at slightly different positions. So. So switching the conformers is, is maybe not the most interesting thing in the world, but um, if you're doing some more involved system preparation um, and you have all of your molecules, say you have a big you know, protein ligand complex and then you have some ions and all this water and stuff, you can, you can, if you want, sort of prepare your positions with some external tool like PacMol or GMX Solvate or something like that. You can create the interchange object without really caring about the positions, because um, you can just go and set those positions later. Okay. Um, uh, lastly, uh, there is also a box object. Um, uh, it, it can be none if the system is non-periodic, um, but if the system is periodic, it's expected to be a uh, I believe a three by three matrix that um, that uh, uh, represents period, represents the periodicity. Um, and again, here from Smirnoff, just makes some effort to infer things based off of the information that's provided. So, uh, like I said earlier, we did not set box vectors on our topology. If, if we wanted to, we could have, but let's just say this is a gas phase. Um, system that we care about, so we don't have box vectors, we can see that the resulting interchange object does not have box vectors. Um, however, if we change our mind later, we can just set those, um, pretty similar to setting the positions. Um, and then finally, you can also, if you want, you can um, set velocities just like setting uh, positions. Um, this is it, not Knock on wood, I can't imagine this um, having sort of fundamentally behave, fundamentally different behavior than uh, positions, but it's also not been tested a whole lot. Um, I think in some cases, if you're doing some, you know, really involved, I think free energy stuff, or if you're doing some involved science, you may want to um, explicitly store the um, velocities of all of your atoms for, you know, tracking whatever thermodynamic state you're in. Okay, that's the end of that notebook. 
Um, we're coming up on the top of the hour again, so uh, this is a good time to take a break, I think, but maybe we should leave if should we open the floor for questions here, Jeff? Yeah, let's open the floor for questions uh, real fast. And actually, I'll make one comment, which is this this behavior where an interchange by default has coordinates, if all of the molecules in the topology had coordinates, uh, this is a big change from what we used to do. Uh, so for everyone who was told open force field, it's easy. Just go load your SDF, run create OpenMM system and simulate. And then you tried to simulate the OpenMM system and learned the painful lesson that it has no idea what its coordinates are, despite the fact that you just loaded a 3D molecule. Um, this behavior and interchange where it's made with positions built in, as long as every molecule in the topology had some positions that it could take, uh, this should make your life way, way easier. <laughs> You know, uh, yeah, so many of our examples have weird, weird position arrays floating around that we have to keep track of separately. And hopefully those days are now behind us now that we're converting over to interchange. Great. Does anybody else have uh, questions or comments about uh, the construction notebook? Okay. If not, we'll go ahead and uh, Matt will queue up the next notebook and now we'll take the first of our breaks. Uh, Matt, do you think a five minute break would be good? Yeah, sure. I just want to get a cup of water. Okay, great. We'll take a five minute break now um, and we will see you back at five past the hour. Thank you very much, everyone.
All right. Thanks, everyone. We'll go ahead and resume momentarily. Okay. Well, let me turn the screen share back over to Matt, and uh, we'll move on to our next notebook. And Matt, could you review the um, the table of contents for today so you get back into it? Yeah, all right. So so far we've gone over um, a lot of a lot of background. We've talked about units, uh, some objectives of the project. Uh, we have made some interchange objects, and the next step we are going to uh, do some exports, um, which should be one of the shorter notebooks. Um, and then after this, after this, we'll actually do the more complicated work of uh, running a protein linking example. Then we'll look a little bit into the internals, and then depending on time, we might do virtual sites. We, we might do something else. Okay, um, so uh, I've talked all right by now a lot about how uh, the goal is to store a lot of information, find ways to get information in, and just kind of uh, track internal state in some way. Um, but that doesn't actually solve your problems. Um, we need to uh, end up talking to talking to MD engines and different files and stuff. So. Uh, Interchange offers a lot of high-level APIs for doing these conversions, um, and we're just going to briefly step through some of these. So uh, my first block of code, I um, make a biphenyl molecule, which is, uh, I think, one of the molecules that OpenFF likes for, for reasons that the scientists would do a better job of explaining than me. Um, but out of this, I load up Sage, and then I call from Smirnoff. Um, you may see, I'm just kind of lazy sometimes, I may pass in a molecule as molecule.2 topology. Um, this, like I was saying earlier, this will do the same thing if I just pass it um, a list of molecules, uh, a sort of one list. Um, those, those will do the same thing. Okay, uh, but some of the exports, um, one of them is uh, a PDB writer. Um, if, if I remember correctly, uh, this uses OpenMM's PDB writer. Um, in general, um, especially with stuff like PDBs that are kind of complicated and have a few uh, sharp edges around them, um, I'm not super interested in making the world's 100th uh, native PDB uh, parser. So for for this and 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 most of these and some of the use cases, we will 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 rely on external tools. Um, let me see if I can show the file just to show that this did something sensible. Cool. Okay. So then this is uh it looks the same because it, it it is basically the same information, but here's the NGL view representation of that molecule. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's exactly what I had prepared. All right. <laughs> um Okay, um, if we want to talk to Chromex, we have uh, dot two grow and dot two um, top, which writes out the uh, grow coordinate and topology file uh, respectively. Um, in this case, uh, we're getting a warning due to kind of a current quirk of um, Chromex not explicitly supporting um, vacuum simulations or, or sort of gas phase simulations. Um, it's basically the same for, 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 I think for most MD settings, it's basically the same if you just pass it a really big box. Um, so in this case, kind of assuming you might be doing single molecule stuff, uh, interchange will actually just set a somewhat arbitrary five nanometer, uh, box. Um, and yeah, this is, you, you can work around this if that's an issue just by, just by setting a box. Um, if, if, I'm, if five nanometers is too small, too small for whatever reason. Um, but if this causes issues, of course, please, please reach out and, and, we'll, and we'll, we'll work through them. Um, and again, here, just showing that, showing using NGL view that the file does, does kind of what you, what you would hope it does. 
Um, I think I'm, I may have showed this off a little bit earlier, um, but there's a to open mm function. Um, there are, I guess there are actually a few, but the high level one on interchange creates an open mm system. Um, and uh, I, I guess those of you who are, who are really familiar with open mm know that it's uh, very, very flexible, which is one of the features, but it's also, but it kind of can lead to to some complexities as well because there are there are for most things a handful of different ways to get to get something done, um, and simulating molecules is no exception to that. So, uh, for uh, for for compatibility with uh, things that aren't sort of the the most simple non bond enforced use case. Um, I, I wrote to OpenMM to actually export a handful of um, custom non-bonded functions. So this splits out the, the van der Waal and um, electrostatics interaction into separate forces. And then uh, a kind of quirky consequence of that is that the one for interactions need to be added back uh, into, into the system by custom bond forces. Um, this uh, this is something that you can turn off if, if this is something you don't prefer. Um, my based on discussion or based on discussions I've had with OpenMM developers, this should not have any impact on performance. But but maybe you you're using some tool that kind of expects a, a non-bonded force instead of all this sort of stuff. So there's an argument that controls that. Um, and if I recall correctly, um, this is this argument is is set to true when this is called inside of the toolkit. Um, I would not say I would not say that one is better than the other. Um, I think they're both they're both they're both fine. Um, but the toolkit since its inception or since the, it had this functionality um, always prepared its forces in this way. So that's that's why it's there in the toolkit just for um, just for uh, maintaining a little bit of um, uh, similarity with, with previous behavior. Um, yes, that, that's that. Um, the the Parmet exports, sorry, Parmet exports, the Amber exports are very similar to the Grumex exports. Um, I'm a little bit less experienced with Parmet than I am with OpenMM. God, I'm less experienced with Amber than I am with OpenMM or Grumex, but as I understand it, um, it's somewhat analogous, these two objects to the, the two Gromax files. Um, and and th this does the, the exports uh, accordingly. Um, yeah, um, you can also write out uh, LAMPs. Um, like I said earlier, uh, LAMPs is comparatively less uh, used by our audience and our partners. Um, and I don't believe anybody in OpenFF uses it internally. So this is less battle tested than the other ones, but it can write out uh, a lamp data file. Um, and then finally, so, um, this is not MD per se, but um, there's a lot of interest in sort of machine learning adjacent groups to get vectorized representations of these parameters out. Um, so we have uh, APIs for that. Um, one kind of detail that becomes pretty clear uh, if you if, if you spend a little bit of time with this is that um, compared to other things like you know uh, if you're going to do deep learning on a photo or a video or something like that kind of you can have everything in one representation um, it, that sort of idea does not map on very well to parameterized mm systems um, because I, I guess just take my word for it because um, I'm, I'm not finding the right ways to, to express this, but it becomes a lot simpler if you split this all out into the different handlers. So short of getting a matrix out for all of the physics parameters at once, um, it, it, makes a, it makes it a lot easier to get them sort of handler by handler. So one for the bonds, one for the torsions, one for the van der Waal, so on and so on. Um, and for each of these, there are two separate ones. Uh, one gets you the force field parameters. Uh, and then the other gets you what's 
called the system of parameters. Um, so in this case, the biphenyl for, for bonds, I guess the biphenyl has three unique bonds using SAGE. My guess is this is carbon-carbon in-ring, carbon-carbon um, between rings, and then carbon hydrogens. Um, and these are, I believe, uh, structured at, in this case as force constant, comma, um, equilibrium bond link. Uh, so that's why this is, happens to be two columns. Uh, different, different handlers will have different shapes. But the number of rows here is the number of unique parameters in the force field. And then these are expanded out into the system parameters. Uh, here, the number of rows uh, are going to be equal to the number of bonds. Um, like I said, if I do a different one, you can see it, you know, it has some similarities, but it's going to have a different number of columns because um, just torsions behave differently than um, differently than bonds. Um, and these are all unitless representations because uh, if you're going to be passing this off to some um, uh, you know, some machine learning library, it's it's going to want stuff in just raw uh, arrays uh, without anything wrapped. So those array those units that would get stripped off of off of these uh, pretty quickly anyway. Um, so this this functionality does not sort of have a clear use right now, but um, this may at some point in the future go into some kind of next generation force field fitting tool. Um, and if you're interested in using some sort of vectorized representation of this stuff, uh, please uh, please get in contact with us. Um, we'd be we'd be interested in seeing how we can how we can facilitate that. Okay, but that's the end of this notebook. Are there any questions on exports before we move on to uh, the protein linked example? Yeah, one thing I might emphasize, we don't need to look at the files now, but we we showed the correctness of the exports in this notebook just by by loading up like the grow file and, and GL view and seeing that it had the right coordinates. But all of these exports have been exporting the physics parameters as well. Uh, so you can you can check for your engine of choice when you run this on your own computer. But yeah, if you crack open those like the parm top file, you should see all the all the physics values in there as well. Oh yeah, perfect. Yep. So here's the parm dot file and in, in, in all of its Fortran glory. If there are All no right. questions, then I think we can move on to yeah, protein ligands. All right, great. Um, first, I want to give credit to uh, I believe this example was largely built off of uh, a toolkit show showcase example that I believe Jeff you wrote two maybe three years ago, um, and has sort of slowly been progressing over time as the as the stack has has, has, has moved around. Um, so what we're going to do here is we're going to, going to take a just one protein linking combination from a set uh, from a data set that was used to benchmark um, some OpenFF force fields. We're going to parameterize it. Um, we're going to solve it, and then we're going to export the system to a few different engines. Um, this is not production ready for a couple of. For, for reasons relating to a couple of details that will that I'll point out when I get there. Um, of course, well, if, if you want to build something off of this, I would just strongly encourage you to to spend some time validating um, validating the exports and sort of the details of the contents that, um, that 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 you might get out of this. All right. Okay, um, first things first, we have a big block of uh, exports, or, uh, exports of imports to run. Um, these, uh, these warnings we can all ignore. Um, okay, let's uh, grab some files. Um, so like I said, we're, we're pulling this from um, uh, a protein link and benchmark data set. Um, I just have these hard links here and we're just we're just downloading these files. We have a protein in a PDB format, 
and we have a ligand in an SDF format. Um, these are, I'm not going to say what is a preferred format and what is not uh, per se, but this is probably the uh, most, this is, this is probably the combination pair, this is probably the most common pairing of uh, molecules to, um, to file formats. Um, and you can see I have a, a bunch of craft in here, but I also have downloaded these two files. Okay, uh, we have to do a little bit of work um, before going straight into the toolkit. Um, I, I think at some point in the future, there's uh, a large interest in um, having the toolkit parse sort of multi-molecule PDB files uh, for something that has sort of various other things in it, like crystal waters and cofactors and dot, dot, dot in it um, that are not just the protein. Um, but for now, the toolkit um, uh, wants PDB files to just have one protein in them. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to use empty trash to um, slice out the crystal waters, I believe. Uh, which I don't think is something you, you want to do necessarily, but it's it's what we need to do to, to get this running. Um, okay, so yeah, so this used uh, MD trash to just pull out that first protein, or to just pull out the protein, which I have to know is, is chain ID zero in this PDB file, and then we saved it out to sliced.pdb. So this is the file that we're actually going to be using for the next few steps. Okay, so uh, the toolkit now offers from Polymer PDB, uh, which builds a molecule from a PDB file. Um, there's a there's a good bit of complexity that is involved with this. Um, I'm not really the person to best communicate that. Um, if you're interested in learning more about this functionality, the stuff it supports, maybe the stuff it doesn't support right now. Um, there's uh, some documentation around that. I believe the um, the version 11, or version 0.11.0 0 .0, uh, release notes would be one good place to look. Um, but also yesterday, Josh Mitchell uh, ran a workshop that did some other stuff, but but spent a, a, a little bit of time talking about um, the the biopolymer functionality in the toolkit. I think at some point in time that recording will be uh, will be live. So if you want to learn more about that, that's something that would um that I, I would encourage you to check out. But now that we can load it, let's load it up. Um, this one might take a few seconds. I actually forgot how long this one takes to run. Um, but I will just skip over a little bit to the next uh, the next section because I know this next one takes a little while to, to run. Who knows if NGLV will load that <laughs> uh, in this at this particular moment in time? Um, so NGLV does a nice trick. Very... Oh, I was going to say for people who are used to running Jupyter notebooks, NGLV does a fun trick in live demos where if you try to execute many cells uh, simultaneously, mm -hmm. none of them will render an NGLV until the last cell is done executing, uh, which is yeah often inconvenient, and I've learned that the hard way. Well. I guess, I guess now, so now is when I learned that the hard way. <laughs> um, okay, so we've loaded the protein. The protein looks good. It looks like a protein. Um, when uh, when Rosemary is released, uh, this next bit will no longer become uh, quite as relevant. Um, but if we want to run protein ligand simulations using Spionoff, um, we will need a force field that uh, supports um, supports uh, proteins and biopolymers. Um, in principle, you could use Sage to do that, but that would not be very good. Um, you, you don't want to use a, a general force field for uh, for proteins. Um, in this case, we're going to use uh, a port, a, a Smirnoff port of FF14SB. Um, there are a, a couple quirks around how the improperties are handled and a total parity with uh, Amber's results, uh, as measured by the energies, I believe is not quite there, but it's pretty close. Certainly, it's fine for um, uh, in instructive purposes, I would argue, but um, please don't use this in production and assume that it is just a, a, a total uh, one-to-one -one, um, uh, conversion of FF14SB. Uh, 
for TMSB. But all that being said, it's something that we can load into a first field object, so we will do that. Um, that took a little bit to run, or that, that took a little bit to load because it's a, a large first field. And then we will create the interchange object uh, from this, which will take a little bit to run as well. Um, I think in this case, it's just because there's sort of a lot of, there's a lot of stuff to do. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of smart matching. Okay, so we have a protein interchange now. This is uh, the, the result of applying this FF14 SB port to the protein that was loaded up by the toolkit. Um, and I just want to emphasize here, the the way you do this is is kind of the same, uh, no matter what first field you use, no matter what topology you use. Okay, but we don't just want protein in vacuum, so let's keep going. Let's load up the uh, ligand into a molecule object um, like we've been doing before. Um, and then I can load it up Sage. I can make an interchange again, basically the same, basically the same as we were doing before. Um, this may take a little bit to run, um, probably because it needs to run uh, A1 BCC calculations on, on the ligand. I'm not sure how big this ligand is, but that, 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 but that can take uh, a few seconds to run. Out of this, we'll get a ligand interchange. Um, and then from here, uh, we can just add these two interchange objects together. So um, in, in Python in general, um, adding objects is pretty unspecified. So you can't just do that out of the box. But um, when, you're, when you're writing your own code, you can override what happens when you call uh, plus. Um, and interchange has done that. Um, I'm, I'm emitting a warning around this because this is, uh, this is a place where a lot of mistakes can be introduced, but um, we've, we've tested it for some cases and what we've tested so far looks, looks good, I believe. Um, but yeah, this adds them together. This attempts to add the topologies together. This um, attempts to kind of merge the per, uh, potential handlers, um, combine the positions. Uh, make some make some inference about the box vectors, um, but out of these separate uh, parameterization routes, we uh, completed each of those and we just added them together. So now we have a docked interchange that includes the protein and the ligand. Um, and then just to yeah, so again because the because this is already prepared. The, the ligand's already docked. Um, this this will looks nice out of the box. If you just did, if you just made the molecule and you generated random conformers, and it was just kind of somewhere in space, it wouldn't look very good. Um, but yeah, this looks this looks pretty good. Okay, then the last thing we need to do is um, add some water to make this a little bit more useful. Um, I don't think I want to go through all every line of this cell. Um, Basically, what it's doing is it's using a PACMOL wrapper provided by uh, OpenFF Evaluator, doing a little bit of math around um, figuring out the number of waters and stuff. Uh, just to get this running uh, quicker, I set this to have a density of 500 uh, kilograms per cubic meter. This is a density of water, so this is kind of intentionally not a realistic uh, water density, but I just wanted to make this less likely to crash and not run for a few minutes. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, so once all those inputs are prepared, um, this particular function uh, uh, parses the PACMOL output as an empty trash trajectory. And what I care about from that empty trash object is the coordinates and the box vectors. So I will save those into XYZ and box. And then I will, um, separately from that, I will create a water interchange. So I will load up Sage again. Um, Sage includes TIP3P parameters. Um, so this is effectively just using TIP3P. Um, and then I make a water, uh, then I make a topology out of the number of water molecules that I have. And the, that um, the, the water 
molecule that I made. Um, okay, so then now I have a different interchange object representing my waters. And the work that I did earlier means the, the positions, positions of those waters should work with my doc protein. So I will just take that docked interchange, add it to the water interchange, and then I will uh, use the position and box setters to take in the information from the, the, the kind of went, went through this long interoperability uh, um, trek um, using evaluator and in triage. But ultimately, these positions are from PacMol. And then this one might take a second to load up, but this, uh, nice. Okay, so here we can see this looks pretty good. So we have, I think, a, maybe a nanometer or two of buffer of water, and definitely still looks like we have a ligand docked in a protein in what might be a reasonable, uh, reasonable location. Okay, so all of that was kind of system prep, um, but also showing how, um, depending on how you prepare your systems, using the plus interoperator, using the plus operator uh, might be useful. From here, the exports out to the different engines um, are, are relatively straightforward. Um, we can call interchange dot to open MMT to get the system out. And then um, if we, for the open MM topology, um, the topology object from the toolkit provides a two OpenMM method that converts that OpenFF topology to an OpenMM topology. Uh, and we can call that directly, we can call that directly here and get that out. So this, uh, this gets you most of what you need to run simulations in OpenMM. You, you'll still want the positions and the, the box vectors, but those are, those are on your interchange and, and you can pass them onto um, the, onto the setters as appropriate. Um, we also can um, call the different exports out to the, uh, the other engines using just the same API that I described in the previous notebook. Um, unfortunately, uh, these are a little bit slow. So for a very large system like this, um, these will take a little bit longer than I want to wait for in a notebook. Um, but I, I, I hope soon I can make these a little bit more performant. Um, in general, I would not expect performance to be one of the best features of interchange. Um, I mean, wrapping everything in units and writing this in Python means that it's, it, it's not going to be as fast as like some, you know, C++ or Rust parser um, or, or writer, but I, I, I wanna make sure that something like this can be at least exported in, you know, under a minute or something like that, ideally a few seconds. Uh, but anyway, this is that's my explanation of why these are all in um, if else or if, if false blocks, so, so they're not actually running. Okay, um, kind of for my own testing, um, I there's a a module in interchange called drivers that provides these these high level functions that take in an interchange object and computes uh, zero point energies um, in different engines. Um, this is useful for a bunch of testing stuff that um, I, I, don't, I don't think I need to go into here. Um, but for, for, for cases like this, it can be useful to, um, to either spot check uh, things to make sure my bond energy isn't you know, uh, 10 orders of magnitude higher than you'd expect it to be, um, or um, you could also, excuse me, use this to uh, compare the energies reported by different engines via the different exports. Um, like I said earlier, unfortunately, the Amber Grum ex exports for the for the large system are a little bit slow right now. So to demonstrate this, uh, I will just do it for that ligand interchange that we made earlier. Um, and so out of this, I believe right now these are uh, just little pandas data frames, but these uh, report out the uh, different components of the potential energy function kind of as reported by, uh, in this case, it's only OpenMM and Amber because Gromax is not installed because that would make the binder image a little bit bigger. Um, but if Gromax was installed, if Lamps was installed, it would find those, it would add the rows together. 
Um, so you can see here the bond angle torsion uh, numbers are, are very, very close, you know, basically exact, kind of by MM, uh, MM standards. Um, the variable and electrostatics are a little bit quirky. Um, it's just kind of hard to get these engines to agree on on what exactly non you know non bonded methods should be used and stuff. So I, I recognize that, that those numbers are a little bit off, but um, I, I I would discourage you from assuming that that means that the Vanderwall parameters or partial charges are written out incorrectly. It's just just kind of a quirk of how um, of how these are of, of how these engines are called. Um, before I open it up for questions, I did want to point out, um, so we, this example spends a lot of time doing system preparation stuff. Um, by no means are, but by no means is it the case that the um, workflow here is the only way to do it. Um, for example, um, you may have your own favorite way of adding waters into your system. If you want to use GMX solvate, if you want to use um, the, I think there's add solvent in OpenMM. Um, there are uh, you know, there are a bunch of ways to do this. Um, really, all that you need to get out of it is just the information that you you really need. You need the positions of your waters, um, and then probably also the the corresponding box vectors. So this cell you can imagine uh, being written in a bunch of different ways, probably just depending on what you're familiar. Uh, what you're most familiar with or what you prefer. Okay, um, I think I will open it up to questions. Uh, questions then. Have people been able to uh, run this notebook on, on their machines as, as I've been going through it? Um, do people have other questions about usage around here, stuff you could, other, other thing you could do? Um, or just general questions. I'd be happy to help out with anything. I wanted to point out one thing, actually, which is, so we had shown uh, these exports when we, when we're transferring information between um, between these different engines. Uh, the reason why sometimes it's tricky is because the like a parm top and a and a grown ITP file or a grown top file. It's not that it's like a technical problem of like how do I like what data do I take from what fields here and how do I convert it into these fields here. In several cases, these files contain fundamentally different fields, and so we have to do a little bit of guessing when we change from one format to another. Uh, and what we'll probably wind up with in a couple of months, maybe once we start getting more more user reports and and we start understanding which of these information differences cause confusion. Uh, Matt, could you scroll up to the ensure unique atom names? Uh, I think there's a, yeah. So in some formats, uh, atom names and atom types are different. And in some formats, they're one and the same. Uh, for open force field, we don't care. We don't care what an atom name is. Maybe just have bonds between, between particles uh, and the particles are identified by an integer index. But when you export to uh, a, a place that expects maybe globally unique atom names, in the entire file in order to identify the bond parameters or maybe unique atom names within a construct called a residue, it can get complicated. And this is a place where we expect um, user workflows to have a little bit of trouble. So here we have uh, a keyword argument that actual users may need to use called ensure unique atom names, which uh, will start policing sort of how we handle atom names. And this can make your exports work correctly. And, and if you're combining components from different sources, some engines will require unique atom names. Uh, this is similar to the, the combined non-bonded forces keyword argument that Matt had shown in the previous notebook. Um, but yeah, so we're anticipating that in our documentation, we're gonna have a sort of just like a bag of dirty tricks for if you're using interchange in a workflow and the wrong numbers are coming out or, or the specific engine that you're going to is making funny noises, um, we'll, we'll have like a little checklist uh, or like a, a set of tricks that you can use to try and make the different engines happy with these conversions. All right. Well, hopefully this example um, demonstrated in, in some part how, how this might 
this might be a kind of drop in a bowl in, in maybe some of your uh, some of your workflows if you're doing stuff with proteins and ligands, which I think probably most people are. Um, I think maybe one final point that could that I would like to make is um, here there was a kind of a, a non-trivial amount of work associated with, okay, I have these different components, I need to apply these different force fields to them, I'm going to make the different topologies and stuff. Um, when Rosemary is released, uh, it will, uh, the, the key objective, one of the key objectives is, is having a self-consistent biopolymer and small molecule force field. Um, Probably somewhere in there, there will be a water model. I don't want to make any guarantee around that, but um, if, if a water model is included in there as well, then um, this an example like this becomes a lot simpler because we can prepare just one topology with kind of everything in it. Um, and then the force field will include both small molecule parameters and um, uh, all of the torsions and stuff and library charges, charges and stuff that uh, model proteins well. Um, so you, you could kind of do that all in one step. And, and, and maybe if the water model is inclu isn't included, it will, it will still be simpler because that will be kind of two steps instead of one here. Cool. Okay, um, I think based off of the time, I'll go, I'll just jump right into the next notebook and that will probably take us um, maybe not to the hour, but a little bit closer. Um, okay. I am in exploration now, um, and here this is um, split out um, just to spend a little bit more time digging into the details of these of these potential handlers. Um, so I start out with the same code block we did earlier. We, we uh, load up a biphenyl, parameterize it with um, parameterize it with Sage. Um, and I wanted to actually look at the atom indices. Um, just to get a, a visual representation of this, the, the atom indices you can access programmatically from the molecule API. But since this is a small molecule and there's just a couple, um, there's just a couple atom uh, atoms that I'm I'm interested in. I, I wanted to look at it, so I, I yoinked a little block of code from the RDKit cookbook, um, and this uh, just just displays it with uh, with um, with the atom indices. Uh, one small detail is that. Uh, it didn't want to represent. It didn't want to uh, put out a C zero, so I had to add one to all the indices. Um, OpenFF in, uh, indexes everything at zero, um, so this is slightly. You'll see stuff is off by one. That's why. It's uh, okay, also but, worth mentioning. Sorry, with this molecule representation, I realized I saw this yesterday in our warm up. Um, this really is a biphenyl. There's, it's not four fused rings. It's just two rings, and the atom names for the the H's coming off of the biphenyl uh, are are overlapping. There we go. That's yeah. great. Thanks. Yeah. So, okay. Um, so we have these handlers I've talked about a little bit before, um, and I kind of made a reference to how these uh, correspond. Uh, a little bit to um, the parameter handlers in Smirnoff force fields. Um, they're not exactly one-to-one -one because of the way that different partial partial charge assignment methods um, are are split out into different handlers in Smirnoff force fields, but we kind of want to keep them in, in one handler in interchange. So it's not one-to-one, -one, but everything, but some of them are uh, some of them do directly correspond, and, and ultimately all the information in a force field um, has some corresponding representation in, 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 in an interchange object. Um, yeah, so to make these, uh, I, I made a base class uh, specifying kind of a few required uh, fields. Uh, one of these is type, which is a string that just kind of says what type it is, basically. Uh, this is kind of repeated information, but it makes a deserialization um, practical. Um, there's also uh, expression, which is uh, just an, an algebraic representation of whatever potential is used in that. Um, so, you know, for the for the Vanderbilt, that expression is going to be the Leonard Jones um, Leonard Jones twelve six. Um, this is not 
directly parsed in the sort of mathematical sense, but it is used to um, keep track of what is compatible with others. So if you made, um, you know, a uh, 15, six uh, Leonard Jones like um, potential because you think that has better physics associated with that. Uh, you can certainly get it into interchange, but um, some of your other exports might not work because um, depending on what's supported, there'll be some check to make sure it looks like a, a total six Leonard Jones. Um, there's a, another field that specifies the sorted parameters, which is uh, useful for talking to the uh, parameter handlers and, and knowing kind of what I'm expected to, to know how to process. Um, but then most of the data is stored in these um, two other fields that are dictionaries. There's a slot map and, and a potentials. These are, these are both maps. So the slot map is a mapping between topical, topological locations, which I call slots for shorthand. Um, and these map to unique identifiers of applied parameters. And then the potentials field maps between those identifiers and the parameters themselves. Um, so we have to look at that. Uh, okay, so let's try and work through this with the, uh, with the, with the bond handler. So uh, yeah, so with the bond handler, I have uh, a couple of these required fields. The type is just bonds and the expression is just the, the, the harmonic bond uh, form that we're familiar with. Um, these, the next two fields are not used in Sage uh, directly, but they kind of demonstrate how each individual handler might add a little bit of information. So if you're going to do uh, bond order interpol interpolation, <clears throat> excuse me, Smirnoff requires a couple more fields to know the, the type and then, then, then how you're actually assigning the fractional bond orders. Um, and these are um, processed from the uh, force field directly. Okay, but the actual um, important stuff here is in the slot map. So like I said, this is a, a mapping, so we use a dictionary. And this maps between the, the keys are these topology key objects, which, which store atom indices, and then the values are these potential key objects, which know just a little bit about uniquely identifying the parameters. So let's pluck out the very first one um, just by unwrapping it into a list and grabbing the first, uh, the first value. So this topology key is associated with the bond handler and it includes these two atom indices. So this is just saying the bond between these two atoms. It doesn't know, doesn't know anything about the physics. Um, this we want to map onto an identifier of the physics and the identifier of the physics will not be the physics directly, but it will be a key pointing to it. So then here, I will look up in my slot map, I will pass it a key that is the first topology key. And then out of that, I get my potential key. And this potential key is uh, just a little, just a little object that knows what handler it's associated with and some unique identifier of that potential. So in the case of Smirnoff force fields, you can uniquely identify parameters with in an individual handler with just the uh, smirks pattern. So this is the smirks of what, what, what was applied there. And this is, I think this is just a pretty general aleph, uh, aliphatic smirks. Um, you could imagine for, for uh, other atom typing scheme, for other typing schemes, this could be like, you know, two atom types uh, squished together if you're doing OPLS or, or something Amber style. Um, and then once you have that, uh, okay, sorry, that's the information included in there. And then uh, once you have that potential key that maps onto a potential object. Um, and I know there's kind of a lot of, a lot of layers to this, but there's, there's, a, there's a point to all of this. Once we arrive at actually uh, having the potential object, um, that actually stores the parameters here. Um, so out of all of this work, we've, we've gotten to the point where we know for atom, for the bond between atoms uh, zero and one, this is a force constant, this is the equilibrium length. These are the values that are sort of prescribed by the force field. Um, the, the mapping here kind of has these, has these extra layers because um, 
we want to make sure that we can deduplicate the mapping between um, uh, between the potential keys and potentials themselves, because my slot to potential key mapping uh, is going to have be as many slots, so as many bonds. But then the second mapping, uh, I can deduplicate it out a lot, which just kind of helps storing stuff in memory. Um, okay, so um, with all this information, I wanted to also show kind of one way you could maybe do something a little bit more useful with it. Um, I think this might be one cell that had a slight modification since uh, the um, since the release that I tagged yesterday. Um, but it's it's pretty close, and I think if you follow along, you'll you'll be able to see the differences. Um, so we can just kind of take the code from the previous few cells and wrap it all up together into a function that uh, takes in an interchange and then takes in uh, a, a tuple of atom indices. And then we can sort of automate the the what we did in the in the previous few cells. Um, and you can, you know, get a little bit closer to kind of interesting scientific questions. So what I've done here is I've uh, called this function on the interchange and I've asked it, okay, what, what are my, uh, what's my uh, equilibrium bond length um, for uh, the bond between zero and one? And then what's the same thing for my bond between five and six? And I picked that five and six because from earlier, this is five and six, same as six and seven. That's the bond between the two phenyl groups. So, um, so that's, uh, um, yeah, uh, you could also, you could, uh, you know, modify this a little bit. Maybe the bond length isn't the thing that you're most interested in. Maybe you care about the force constant um, because, I don't know, something's too floppy or not floppy enough and you can sort of you can sort of do the same thing and see that um i have i have slightly different force constants as well here um so i wanted to do this to kind of demonstrate how um how you could use stuff like this to um to do the inspection of your systems um and then here uh here i also rewrote it again slightly to instead um, look at the torsions that kind of correspond to in each ring in between the ring. Um, and you can see that the, um, these are the proper torsions, not the, um, well, I guess these are aromatic, aren't they? Yeah. So um, I don't believe that these are, I don't know for, for these systems how much of the planarity is defined by the proper versus the improper torsions, but you can see the you know the force constants here are, are different by quite a bit. Okay. Um, any questions on this notebook? Um, again, hopefully you can see how, how a little bit more of the internals here and how um, and how you might be able to use this in in your research or, or your workflows. Okay. If there's no questions, um, then we might go for our second and final break of the workshop. Um, and what we'll do here is we'll take another five minute break. And so we'll come back on the hour. And after the hour, uh, we'll have the choice. There's another kind of advanced. So this exploration notebook, I would consider a bit advanced. Uh, I think it's it's cool. Uh, because it goes into some of the neat architecture and it shows you the inner workings of interchange. Uh, the next notebook that we could run is also a little bit niche. It's about virtual sites and how they're represented in an interchange. So we'll have the choice of either running that, um, but maybe what we'll do when we come back, we'll have a, a more open discussion and Q&A in case people do have larger topics that they're wondering about. Um, and then we can we can take a vote as to whether to go on to the virtual sites uh, notebook or if we want to to extend the discussion and developer support time. So thank you very much, everyone. We'll be back uh, on the hour. All right.
Well, folks can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe this is this year is the last year that the U.S. will go through daylight savings time. I've noticed, especially in the age of Zoom, it's difficult to uh, it's difficult to give absolute times for people in different time zones. And so we always we always give reference to the hour. And thankfully, we don't have any uh, any Venezuelans or anybody who's offset by 30 minutes uh, <laughs> in the consortium or I think in our in our audience yet. Uh, but yeah, I look forward to to not having daylight savings anymore. I believe we'll we'll do the cycle once more in the United States and then we're done. I think after the next switch, that would be permanent. Uh, do we yeah. do one more? I think it's uh, we'll do the the cycle once more. But there's oh, like okay. there's summertime, which is a good time with late sunsets, and then there's like winter time, which is a sad time with early sunsets. And I don't think anybody on Earth actually likes winter time. I don't know why we still have it. And so I think we're going to do winter time this year, and then when we come back, it's it's summertime permanently. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> I think I could be wrong. I'm optimistic. Um. Okay. Well, we'll see when Matt gets back. One thing I did want to ask is, uh, so we showed this this objectives uh, slide, and one of the important things on it that we could use a little bit of feedback on, and that might be worth a little bit of discussion, is this objectives uh, diagram, if you look at the right side of it, and I think that's the part that we're kind of emphasizing today, we're talking about uh, the interoperability with a bunch of engines. And so we, right now we have all of these arrows coming out of interchange. And, uh, you know, if all of these arrows were bi-directional, so if we could both export to Amber and also import from Amber and, you know, then immediately export to a different format. Uh, once all of these arrows are bi-directional, we're basically Parmet. And it's, it's a big goal, but in the long run, we do want all of these arrows to be bi-directional. Uh, I would, I would wonder from, some of our, our partners here today, if you're using ParMed and, and you're thinking about using Interchange to replace ParMed, which of these pathways are most important for you? Are there, are you using uh, sort of the existing formats or, or do your workflows have uh, internal formats that you'll need to convert parameterized molecules to and from? Uh, yeah, if anybody wants to chime in, we'd, we'd love to know sort of which pathways to prioritize. Okay, I'll go first. So we're, we're primarily going from, in essence, the, the OpenFF stuff through to Amber formats. And, okay. then, and then taking the Amber formats into OpenFM. And the, the reason we do that rather than go directly into OpenMM is because we also want to allow users to sort of you know, prepare externally their own palm top files and load those in and so rather than having two completely separate paths for one starting from a molecule one starting from a palm top we, we just take everything to a palm top file i see so you send everything to palm top and then you use the amber suite to to combine all the components into like a single system and then you send that to open them no we we build all of the components ourselves so we use a combination of the open effect toolkit and palmed to combine all the components together into a, a single palm top. And then we just take that through into OpenMM. Oh, I see. You you have OpenMM directly read the palm top because it yeah. has a palm top reader. OK. Exactly, yeah. Cool. Has that? So we know with OpenMM, we had just described some of our, our difficulties where we see particles as integer indices in a larger topology, whereas a lot of uh, the existing engines see parameters being applied between atoms of certain types. Uh, do you encounter that a lot using ParMed on a, on a larger scale in conjunction with OpenFF exported molecules? Uh, I don't think so at the moment. We're, we're not heavy users of ParMed. Um, we used to use it a bit more, but actually at the moment, most of the stuff we do using the OpenMM force fields code to go from sort of molecules straight into a, a topology and thence to a, a um, sort of a, amber format topology and coordinate files. 
So at the moment we're fairly light touch users of PubMed just for the occasional tweak. Okay, excellent. Yeah, we've noticed in putting together these examples, I think we didn't understand initially the underlying principles of, of how to combine components from different things, or you know, if we want an amber parameterized protein and a, something else parameterized ligand, what pathways we'd be taking. And we found that the big commonalities were um, before interchange, if we're setting up a protein ligand simulation, we basically would either find ourselves using ParMed or uh, OpenMM force fields. Yep. And, you know, both of those are a little bit tricky. ParMed doesn't like that, that we don't respect atom names and atom types and OpenMM force fields is, I think, intended to be like a stopgap provided by the Codera lab um, mm -hmm. while, while sort of OpenFF takes off. Yep. And so we are targeting a lot of the functionality that we see as essential from those packages in a protein ligand workflow. We're, we're targeting replacing those with, with interchange. So your feedback would be especially valuable if you start uh, integrating interchange into your workflows, because um, we would love to know what's slow, what's, what's inconvenient, what is convenient, yep. um, so that we can, we can work better for you. The one thing that's likely to be fairly important for us is actually preserving atom names. Um, just because we've got a, a whole swathe of machinery to start from a protein and go through sort of various prep stages and lay users to tweak it and then feed it eventually out through the machinery into OpenMM, run a dynamics and then read in the output. And things always get moved around a little bit. And so we've got a, a complicated set of atom mapping codes. And I swear half of our code base is atom mapping codes by these days. Uh, but, but that relies <laughs> fairly heavily on the fact that, you know, if this atom's called C14 in the output, it's going to be called C14 in the input. And that's how I can tell it's the same atom. Yeah, Matt, could you, um, in the chat, could you post the doc string for um, for something with ensure unique atom names? So basically, yes, we ran into the same thing where, where it was hard to predict when we could preserve atom names and when we absolutely had to change some atom names so that the exported file would have the correct physics. Yeah. Um, and so we just posted, uh, in it, shortly before our last big release, we put in a method that uh, it, so you saw the keyword ensure unique atom names and it was false or maybe it was true in the thing that we saw and we realized that true and false doesn't provide the granularity that you actually need to use this in the real world. Yep. And so now you can provide either true, false, or the name of a residue iterator. So you could say, um, uh, you know, don't ensure unique atom names anywhere. That's false. True means ensure unique atom names everywhere. And then residues for example, I'd like the string residues would say, there's an iterator on this molecule called residues and within each residue, make sure that the atom names are unique, but between yeah. residues, they can be different. And so that's that's part of our effort to not completely obliterate everybody's atom names. <laughs> yeah, and part of the issue we've had, you know, we're using the, the Amber um, formats for sort of historical reasons, but the pain we have with them is of course, they completely blow away all of your residue numberings and identities. So it's, you know, which aspartate in the output was the aspartate in the input? Again, that's <laughs> not necessarily always trivial. Yeah, oh man. And then uh, uh, Open Free Energy put in a, an 11th hour feature request to respect insertion codes, which we hadn't even considered before. Uh, so now we respect insertion codes uh, as being that's a good. defining characteristic. Yep. Of, yeah, yeah, of yeah. as long as you sort of support, you know, residue names, numbers, and insertion codes, that's going to make me very happy indeed. Okay, great. Then, yeah, I think I think you should be happy, but I'd love feedback if uh, the new toolkit's doing something that you don't like. Cool. Thanks. Does anybody else have uh, like a, a story about what important export pathways would be really important for them? Because this this is basically going to guide our, our development priorities for the next year, if we can hear from you. Well, if no one has strong opinions, yeah, we'll we'll continue prioritizing kind of Amber and OpenMM uh, as as top priority and, and Gromax as well. And nobody's really come and made a compelling case for for Charm or Lamps yet. And so we'll probably keep those sort of on the back burner. We'll prioritize the top three, um, and and 
wait until somebody complains about uh, charm and lamps not being supported or, or having issues. Okay, cool. Thanks. Does anybody, so we're going to get into the virtual sites notebook after this, which is a bit of a niche topic and may not apply to everyone. Uh, so does anybody have uh, like any bigger topics uh, like guidance questions or um, or sort of topics about any of the previous notebooks that we've looked at today? Okay, if not, as always, feel free to put questions in the chat. And yeah, Matt, I think we can go ahead and get started with the, the virtual site exploration notebook. All right, um, let's. Okay, um, we should be back to my Chrome window with a bunch of notebooks open and do it. That's good. All right, um, so um, this uh, largely builds off of, I think, I think stuff we've done, we've done already. Um, the the point I kind of I, I, I kind of keep repeating is that interchange uh, as long as you're not, as long as you're not using GVSAs, um, interchange will take in whatever uh, sort of Smirnoff style force field you pass it, um, and whatever uh, toolkit topology um, you you provide it. So so here um, it's. Uh, I'll mostly be going through stuff that's similar to what we've already gone through. Um, it's just that the forest field has virtual sites, and we'll see sort of how how that um, how that affects the exports a little bit. Um, so to do this, I actually want to run some simulations. Um, so we we have a a, a short we, we have a function that takes in um, a, takes in a few objects and runs a short simulation in in OpenMM. And then it uh, somewhere along the way it it, it uh, writes uh, writes out a trajectory that we can, we can then look at. Okay, so um, what we're going to do is we're going to start by adding some weekend. Um, this requires a field virtual sites. We will, we will write up a little bit. Um, this is all described in detail in Spirinov specification. Um, uh, I just got the your internet is unstable thing. Um, if 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 I if if I was lost for for a while, just please interrupt me and let me know if I you, need to go back. You stuttered, to... you stuttered a little, but you sound good now, and I don't think you need okay, to repeat cool. anything. Cool. Um, so there's there's documentation about uh, the virtual site. Uh, support in Smirnoff, uh, in the Smirnoff specification, and a little bit more um, user-facing docs in the toolkit. Um, so this this might look kind of complicated and dense and long, um, but the the short of it is um, we have three different types of virtual sites here. One of them is going to add a couple of kind of lone pair virtual sites onto a sulfur, and then the other are going to add kind of uh, sigma hole correcting or something like that. Um, uh, virtual sites into uh, around halogens, specifically kind of along the bond between a halogen and uh, the carbon that it's bonded to. So that information is all encoded in this uh, in the string, this kind of XML-like string. And then um, remember that Smirnoff force fields, you can sort of load a bunch up at once. Um, which which allows you to you know squish together water models, squish together water models, do do weird stuff, do a bespoke force field that's tacked onto Sage. And what we're doing here is we're just adding these virtual sites to Sage. So I wouldn't say that we're we're using Sage uh, now because we're kind of using a modified form of it, but we're we're using something that's based off of based off of it. Um, and it should go without saying just because of the number of state things, but. These numbers are have like no scientific basis, and if you, you know, the physics here are probably probably worse than having than not having virtual sites. So these are not these are not trained at all. Um, so we will uh, uh, 
do I, okay, I did not run to self, that was the problem. Um, so this is a kind of large ligand, so it'll take a little bit to, um, to create the interchange. I think most of the time is spent doing the, the A1 BCC. Um, this will take a few seconds, um, but here you can see the ligand. We have this sulfur in the middle that will have uh, a couple of virtual sites tacked onto it to um, you know, do something with the ESP around the, the lone pairs that actually do exist on sulfur. And then we have the, the fluorines on the left, and then we have chlorines on the on, on the bottom, and there should be some sort of sigma hole type virtual sites um, on these. Uh, I'm going to run these cells ahead of how I'm talking, just because we can see this one is um, this one is taking a little while. So so again, this this ape, this uh, from screen off crawl looks very similar to what we've done before. Um, one difference here is that uh, virtual sites are added on as a separate handler. Uh, so I want to assert that, that, that they're in there. Um, the internals are, are tricky because virtual sites um, need to know about geometry and stuff, but they also affect, uh, potentially affect the electrostatics and Vanderbilt interactions. So there's a lot of crosstalk between those handlers, um, especially uh, when you're exporting stuff out. Um, but here we just want to run uh, like a couple of picoseconds uh, in OpenMM. Um, so to do that, we're going to get a, an OpenMM topology and, and an OpenMM system. Um, a, a small quirk kind of in our infrastructure um, right now is that, uh, so you may remember earlier, I used interchange dot topology dot to OpenMM to get an OpenMM topology out. That's because uh, the toolkit already has this way of going from the OpenFF topology to an OpenMM topology. So I'll just use it. Um, the the thing is, virtual sites don't really ex virtual sites don't exist in molecules. They're sort of a a, a construct of uh, of applying a force field to a molecule. So in that sense, th there's no way that the toolkit can can really can can uh, sort of formally know about virtual sites. So you can't put a virtual site on a molecule object. You can sort of only deal with that at the interchange level because you need to know a little bit of the physics associated with, with it as well. So if I call interchange.topology.2 openmm, I will not get my virtual sites because again, the toolkit does not know about them or the, the molecule uh, object does not know about them. Um, to make that actually happen though, there's a separate interchange dot to open mm topology method that does basically the same thing as the toolkits to open mm but it does include the virtual sites so I, I understand this is a little bit confusing because there are two things that look pretty similar but two things that are not quite exactly the same uh, I, I get it and I, I hope in the future we can find a way to make this a little bit more um, uh, a little bit smoother but but for now we need to we need to call this method to ensure we get the virtual sites um, there's nothing different about calling the OpenMM system. Um, the, the handling of virtual sites is, is handled in there. Um, here are just some checks. Uh, this is not needed to run the simulation, but I wanted to um, just get out the number of virtual sites. Um, you can do this by querying the OpenMM topology. Um, and I want to make sure that the number of virtual sites that are in the topology is the same that, as the number of virtual sites in the system. And then also the same as the number of slots in the virtual site handler. And, and those are all the same. In this case, it's, it's five, uh, five virtual sites everywhere. Okay, and then we can run a simulation. It took two seconds because we didn't run it for very long. And then you can see I have, you know, I just have this little molecule dancing around in space. The physics of this movement look uh, reasonable, I would argue. And if we look at the actual molecule, um, the, the PDB doesn't, the, this particular PDB file or the way it's parsed through MD trash or something, it doesn't really know about, um, uh, about virtual sites. They just count, it just kind of looks like different particles. So uh, some extra bonds are, are drawn. Um, you can see on the sulfur here, the sulfur is the yellow and the two other the, the two virtual sites are these yellow spheres. These bonds are obviously non-physical, but that's because you don't really have bonds between virtual sites and the kind of next carbon over. 
So uh, we can see that the virtual sites are on the sulfur here. And then this is a chlorine. You can see a virtual site was added. I guess it was on the other side of the bond, but you can see. And then kind of the same story here with, I think these were fluorines. So cool. We have our virtual sites from our force field. We run it through everything that we were doing before, and we actually have virtual sites in our output. And uh, bad force field parameters aside, um, I would anticipate that the, the the virtual sites are actually going to have an effect on the on the physics. So, so this shows that it, it kind of all works. Um, and in the future, um, ho hopefully, there's a, a mainline OpenFF force field that includes virtual sites. Um, and you know, short of more extensive uh, testing and validation of all the various um, all the various possible cases of virtual sites uh, and, and, and the different things. Um, interchange basically supports these um, just with whatever whatever force field um, is, is, is provided to it. Okay, um, so to get maybe a little bit more involved, um, I wanted to show off how if you if you want to dance through a couple of hoops, you can also take this ligand, which has virtual sites on it, and solvate it in water uh, using a foresight water model. So now there are virtual sites on the water molecules as well. Um, we're currently uh, discussing ways that open force field might um, distribute water models uh, or, or potentially other uh, other uh, kind of commonly used force fields in Smirnoff format. Uh, nothing's kind of uh, set in stone right now, and um, so I can't make any guarantees around it. But um, I, I would like I would like to be able to uh, ship out this uh, this XML without without digging into my tests. And and I suppose um, I suppose in, in cases like these, just just passing around the XML snippets and examples is is, is okay. Um, but anyway, this is a uh, a, uh, a Smirnoff encoding of tip 4p. And just like before, where I tacked on the virtual site uh, XML onto Sage as it was being loaded, I just tacked this on. Um, so from here, I load everything up and I have this one force field object. I wanted to give it a different name to avoid accidentally confusing myself because uh, this is all in one notebook. But this is Sage plus the virtual site uh, bit plus tip 4p. Um, this block of code should look pretty similar because I basically stole it from the uh, protein ligand example we went through a few minutes ago. Uh, I won't I won't go over that. Uh, I won't go over that again. Um, this takes the ligand, finds a number of water finds a number of water molecules, um, and and solvates them into into an empty trash trajectory. Uh, while this runs, though, I will make uh, a subtle point here. Um, so, so I loaded tip 4p into the force field. So now there's one object in memory that I have that knows I'm going to do virtual sites. Um, this entire block of code here does not know anything about virtual sites. Um, it uh, doesn't know that we want to use tip 4p on our water. It doesn't know that we want to use these virtual sites on our ligand. Um, uh, in principle, I could use the same block of code and I can apply tip 3p. And I believe one of the examples in the interchange repo uh, does this, where we sort of build everything with a three site water model. And then because those molecule objects are the same, if you're going to use a, a three or a four or five or whatever site water model, uh, water model um, you can just reuse that topology, just applying a different force field to it. So, so, so again, because like the Pacmal stuff all ran with, um, without virtual sites, um, you can kind of use different force fields uh, along the way there. Okay, um, and then what I do is, um, I think stuff that I, I think I've, I've shown before um, plenty of times, again, I make a topology, I wanna set my box vectors and positions, I make an interchange passing the, the stuff that I made um, and then just to show off that we can run a simulation, um, I, I call this same, um, I call these little helper functions again. This one took a little bit longer since I have waters. And then this, this uh, representation is a little bit more involved, 
but I want, want to show that um, it definitely looks like the ligand still has these virtual sites on it. And the water looks pretty funky because um, visualizing uh, four and five site water models is, is kind of funky. Um, but you can see, even though this is at a kind of goofy low density, uh, the very early trajectory physics that you get out of it is at least at least more sensible than just blowing up. So, um, you know, from this, I would have some some reasonable confidence that, that the simulation will actually run. Okay, so uh, this again, this example shows off how well, once you once you get um, the virtual site parameters into a Smirnoff force field, interchange just handles them, um, and then depending on you know how how you actually call your engine, you might want to do slightly different things. So we had to jump through a couple of hoops to get the virtual sites into the OpenMM topology. Um, but again, once um, once virtual sites uh, hopefully exist in a mainline OpenFF force field at some point in the future, interchange is ready to handle them and. If you want to write your own Smirnoff uh, first field using virtual sites or port some existing first field that uses virtual sites into Smirnoff, um, it should be pretty well supported. Okay, uh, that's the virtual site notebook. Um, any questions on any questions on this or other things people would like to discuss? Okay. If there's nothing, I'll, uh, yeah, Matt, Matt made helpful mention of a couple things. Oh, thanks, the one. Uh, yeah, Matt made a mention of a few things that uh, more or less interchange currently smoothly handles everything in a released OpenFF force field because all of the inter, uh, because all of the OpenFF tools are both um, production tools and research tools. Uh, we build out the infrastructure for our next generation of force fields before those force fields are released because our infrastructure is used to fit the force fields. That's how we make sure that people get the correct parameters applied um, as, as we use in training. Uh, and so for our future plans regarding force field releases, uh, we, we hear a lot from our advisory board that they would really like uh, us to include virtual sites, that OPLS already includes virtual sites, and why don't we? And uh, it, it is a big topic, so here you can see we have the infrastructure ready, but uh, the numbers are all made up. The numbers are just mashing on a keyboard. And to do the training is, is a bit difficult, and we're working on the infrastructure to the training correctly. Um, it's, you know, a, a, a poor man's virtual site implementation could be trained using just electrostatics, uh, which, we can, which we can calculate using our, our quantum chemistry implementation. But a better one, and, and to be consistent with the previous OpenFF uh, force field training that we've done, we should not just be fitting to electrostatics, but also physical property data. And it's hard to get uh, enough physical property data for, uh, for example, sulfur-containing molecules, to you know the density of these mixtures of sulfur-containing molecules such that we could train uh, a virtual site-containing force field on them. Uh, we're sort of in a data scarcity position right now. And what that means is for the Rosemary force field, we're looking at improvements to electrostatics, but they're still going to be atom-centered point charges. Uh, like our, our plan A is uh, you try to move to something better or more scalable than AM1 BCC, so either higher quality or um, uh, an implementation like a, um, uh, a neural net that uh, can look at larger molecules and, and assign AM1 BCC charges that are consistent with how we've trained our force field but to things like big polymers. And that would that would let people do amazing things in material science and, and formulation chemistry. Uh, so yeah, again, just to temper expectations. We're super excited about virtual sites. We've got them implemented in the toolkit and an interchange and we can run simulations, but it will be some time before we come out with a parameter set that includes virtual sites. Okay. If nobody has questions or comments, uh, we'll get into developer support time. 
Um, so first, thank you all for for joining us today. And this was this was really great that we had a, a good audience. Um, if you are trying to use Interchange and you run into any trouble, we encourage you to look at uh, to talk to us on the Interchange issue tracker on GitHub. And this is uh, a good way for us to make sure that we understand the details of your your issue and that we can uh, direct future future development to resolve uh, what you need. You can find further examples as Matt is showing in the Interchange examples folder in the in the main repository. So this is separate from the the uh, workshop repository that you were sent today, but the main repository is not too hard to find. It's in the open force field organization called OpenFF Interchange. Uh, if you'd like more uh, urgent support, uh, we have on our open force field Slack, there's a channel called tech support that you can write into, and we'll, we'll try to handle your problems as quickly as possible. Uh, the, that's better for sort of quick usage questions. Um, if it's a feature request, you'll probably just get redirected to the um, the issue tracker to, to sketch it out. So we can put it on our roadmap in detail. Um, right, and so I'll stop the recording.